Hey, what's up? Uh, we're going to cover some uh, silent films. I love silent films, man. Uh, I actually made like a, a silent horror film a couple of, more than a couple of years ago. And I'll probably do a couple of more at some point. Of course, the music video stuff that I, I want to do is in that vein. Uh, these are, of course, fantastical films. German silent cinema, probably the best. In between the wars, the you know these films were made when my uh, grandparents were young. You know, the, the, this is a world. It looks like an alien world. These old silent films, uh, you know, the dreamlike quality of the different frame rate and the silence. Okay, of course you have music, but um, this was the world my grandparents were young in. And I guess if you're younger than me, your great grandparents, like an alien world. Okay, but all the things that happened a century ago. Uh, the uh, oldest of these is more than a century old now. Uh, it's like a window in time, okay? But there's relevance, particularly in the German cinema, there's relevance. Cinema, of course, was seen as a, by certain special, you know, certain historical figures, uh, Lenin amongst them, uh, a couple of others I, you know, won't bother to mention. Uh, they saw the power of it, okay? The old Richard Wagner concept of the perfect artwork, which he could not have known, you know, he didn't include photography in that. Uh, but the idea of, you know, the opera and all the arts put into one were realized by cinema. Uh, by taking a, a photographs, uh, 18 photographs in a second, uh, and then having them move into each next uh, photo, uh, produces moving films, cine cinematography, as the French called it who are the leaders in that of course your boy edison invented his own camera around the same time uh, but anyway i'll just go through these briefly and try to give you a little something interesting about each film that you probably won't hear on most of the uh, film nerd uh, channels because my, my goal here is to share these with you um, in, in the context of the the themes i try to get across uh, um, and all of these movies, I believe, are public domain and on YouTube. I, of course, have these just in case they decide to change that. Uh, so I could watch these in the cabin in the woods, you know, when the next plague rolls around. So we'll start with this. Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. He's probably the odd man out here. It's kind of a horror film. But these are more science fiction and fantasy. Uh, and way lower budget. 1919. So this film came out when the Kaiser abdicated, when the uh, Spanish influenza was killing millions of people, uh, and the frontline soldiers were coming back to find uh, Reds running around everywhere killing people, uh, and they decided they weren't going to have that. Uh, the interesting thing about this film, obviously, the Cuba sets. Okay, uh, I believe the set designer was trying to uh, emulate expressionism, German expressionism. He wasn't really uh, an expressionist himself, uh, but it, it gives the film that weird quality. Okay, you could say that some of it looks fake or stage set, but some of it really adds like this strange angle. It adds to the dreamlike or nightmare-like quality of the film. Um, you know, I actually, despite being a right-wing person, I actually like a lot of modernism at the time. Not all of it, and I do admit its limitations. Uh, modernism is dated, and uh, as Jonathan Battle would say, it's a cul-de-sac, uh, a.k.a. A, 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 a dead end. And I agree with much of it, but there's, there's elements in it that I like. Uh, and as for the film, uh, it's an interesting film. Uh, the killer here, Caesar, there's some scenes that almost remind me of like Halloween with Michael Myers. I know, uh, linking it to uh, the more recent times. But the, the thing I want to leave with is that the writers here, okay, the writers were kind of lefties, uh, to say the least. Uh, we know the political situation at the time in 1919. It was crazy, okay? Um, the message they put in, the subversive message, was very, very left-wing, let's say. Uh, what was great about it is that the director uh, and the producer, uh, they actually added something at the end to totally negate that message. And, and if, I think it was done for commercial reasons. I don't even think it was intentionally done. I don't think these guys realized uh, the elements of it, but they essentially do that. Uh, they, they more than just negate the leftist message in it. 
they actually bring up other things. They bring up other ideas of the so-called hero. Okay, the whole idea is Caligari is this authority who's actually the the mastermind, the insane mastermind behind all these events. Uh, but the way the ending is done, that they add on, totally, like I said, negates that and brings up other questions about the protagonist. Uh, like I said, it's uh, it actually is more satisfying now. I could see people being disappointed by it back in the day, but... Uh, with what we know now, it actually like, works really, really well uh, and is it puts a smile on my face. Uh, and a side note too, The Cabinet of Dr. Gal Caligari, when it was released in America like uh, in the 1920 or about two years later, there were riots in the theaters because the Americans weren't going to give money to some damn German film after, after the war you know, that had happened. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. They had riots in it. Uh, and they took the film out of the theater. So, um, so this is if you went to watch this, you were taking your life in your hands, which is kind of cool. But uh, yeah, so now these other films, like I said, are more different. They're bigger budget studio films, and they're all fantastical. Your roots of science fiction and fantasy are in these films. Okay, uh, let's see how we do this. We'll go with this here, F.W. Murnau, okay, Faust. Now, he's, of course, best known for uh, uh, Nosferatu. It's a rather low-budget film in comparison to this film is epic, uh, to say the least, big budget. There's, there's special effects in this film uh, that, you know, you might think they're primitive, but they're actually pretty cutting. Uh, they, they, they still hold up immensely well. All of these things hold up well by the way uh maybe younger people don't think so but you know you know how i feel about that and obviously this is um uh, the devil makes the deal you know with faust okay uh, you know are you familiar with dr faustus by christopher marlowe okay but this is johann wolfgang goethe's uh, faust the german idealist uh, my mother's favorite poem she knows the poems in actual german and they are some of the most beautiful and macabre uh, works you will ever find. If you want to read probably the most, one of the most beautiful and dark um, vampire uh, poems, I guess, or narratives, you'd say, read The Bride of Corinth. Okay? Uh, Anne Rice must have read that, but it blows away uh, all the novels she wrote. That one poem blows away anything. Uh, with vampires one of the best vampire narratives ever uh, the bride of Corinth and with Faust of course the ending of this is a little different this is German idealism the macabre is mixed with uh, other things uh, there's so many scenes in this that are just amazing go check it out um, the scene where the devil spreads the plague in the German city in the beginning really well done it looks like a black metal album cover or death metal album cover uh, and the scene also of the uh, the woman with her child who's on christmas eve is out in the snow looking for a haven and nobody helping her uh, is very touching very touching and beautiful as she lies in the snow uh, and the snow starts to cover her uh, uh, now the Fritz, these are Fritz Lang films. We all know Fritz Lang, right? He made the sound film M, which is a brilliant movie with Peter Lorre. Uh, but these are his silent works, and these are things he did in co uh, cooperation with a female writer, Thea von Harbo, very talented woman. Uh, she wrote very good, interesting, strong yet vulnerable, and uh, female characters with depth. They have on horrible, but for some reason, uh, you 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 barely ever hear her mentioned. Uh, you can look up why. <laughs> uh, Woman in the Moon is, uh, I guess, the real science fiction. Yeah, they have the, uh, the uh, people. There's air on the moon. I know that kind of ruins the idea, but uh, the drama of the film of the first space flight to the moon is and the the technical, the miniature work here. Uh, using the actual theories of uh, certain scientists at the time who were going to make rockets to possibly go into space are encapsulated here. And the drama, of course, is interesting too. At the end, she has to make a sacrifice that is 
done in a very realistic way. I'll say that. Um, uh, and it's funny too. Like, oh, that looks like a V2 rocket. Well, uh, these guys had ideas of going to the moon uh, and going to Mars. And we're never going there. Uh, thanks to the events of all the years ago. But anyway, one of the moons it was definitely a science fiction a classic. Right? The other science fiction classic, we all know this, Metropolis. Okay, uh, all your science fiction cinema stuff uh, comes out of this movie. Every Lucas, Spielberg, everybody saw this film. Now, once again, uh, screenplay by Dea Von Harbo, directed by Fritz Lang. Once again, the actress has an amazing role. She plays a dual role. You know, she plays an almost religious-like leader. Uh, and then she plays the android that's made to subvert uh, her purpose. And she acts like a, a mad woman, you know, a uh, kind of like a, a, a flapper. Uh, she causes a lot of issues uh, in the film. And the interesting thing about the film as well is there's a lot of religious imagery in the film that I did not expect. When you read this, right, look, the New York Times, well, they're, they're right about this uh, thing that they're saying here. Uh, when you watch this, you get the idea of like, you know, this is something, like I said in the Scary Movies review, there's like a Marxist critique in this. This film is a nationalist film. The message at the end of the film is that the classes, you know, need to unite Okay, the the technocrats and the workers and everything, uh, they need to unite. And there's uh, people trying to uh, cause havoc with that, who um, actually are closer to uh, these wealthy uber capitalists uh, than they are even any Bolshevism. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's just an interesting film. Uh, interesting is more than interesting. It's a visual feast. And uh, the architecture that was used uh, for the buildings, especially this great one, was inspired by the modernist uh, Italian futurists who were actually right-wing and not left-wing at all. Look up the futurists, look up Marinetti, uh, so to speak, and uh, the relations they had with uh, 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 politics, let's say. Another reason why, you know, that they are not mentioned a lot and rounding it out, the Nibelungen, we all know this, okay, Wagner, ancient Nordic, when the Germans and the Nords were basically the same. Uh, these are two films, stories, okay, two movies, one after the other. Uh, the first one is uh, absolutely amazing as a fantasy film, of course, the story of Siegfried, uh, the vast forest they built, the, the life-size dragon, mechanical dragon they build. Uh, the dwarves, who are supposed to be the uh, the ancient, old, you know, European, pre-Aryan people, uh, represented as dwarves, you know, like Picts and and whatnot. Uh, it's all mixed together, and um, the the woman is a uh, in the first film. It all ends tragically, of course, uh, but it's just it's a visual feast. It's amazing, and then there's the second film, which is just as good and totally different the second film is basically game of thrones uh, you see the political situation in the uh, this uh, in middle europe at the time uh, with the huns and you have the different germanic tribes some of them are their enemies and some of them are i guess in you know pledge loyalty to them so you have these intermediary germans who are basically loyal to the huns uh, and you have this character who is a sweet in the first one she wants revenge, and she becomes a cruel, manipulative villain in the second film. Uh, it's kind of uh, very interesting how this is done. What a depth the character has. Once again, screenplay by Thea von Harbo and Fritz Lang. Anyway, uh, the Nibelungen. Watch both of them. They really are amazing. That really is an amazing film. From another time. Might as well be another planet now. Okay. But uh, what was in these films, the, the issues, what they represent are timeless uh, in the past, now, and in the future. So look at them for a moment of the dreamlike quality as we go into the twilight and the horizon. Uh, I guess I'm trying to be poetic, but, you know, they're just really cool movies. Uh, uh, check them out uh, later.